What's up, my brother? Two seconds. What's up? Um, wait on David to come in. Hey, buddy. Oh, what's up, my brother? Just living the dream. How about you? <laughs> Trying to do the same. Trying to do the same. Um, first. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you for uh, your time and coming in. Oh, man, Are you kidding? No, absolutely, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, much appreciated. And to, to all the other guests, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so it's the, the purpose of this is, is to try to inspire, to expose, to inform, to learn, to grow, to teach, all of the above, so we can kind of see what it takes to to make all this happen yeah. um, hey we can easily tell somebody how this all works in about an hour i mean it's like a ted talk only <laughs> right right so okay tell us who you are so i'm dave stein uh my company is david stein furniture we've been in business for about 24 years building mostly live edge furniture uh only hardwood furniture uh solid stuff um, I was lucky. I was born on a dairy farm in the middle of the country, a little town called Dow, Illinois. We've got about a thousand acres, about half of its timber. So growing up, we did everything with our hands. And I really just gravitated towards doing work with the forest and the trees and all that kind of stuff uh, to get us, you know, uh, that, that's kind of how I ended up where I am now is just doing that stuff. And I hated milking cows. So that's, that's what I ended up doing. Okay, so um, uh, so le let's go back to high school. Let's okay. start from there. All right. Um, so you, you great. That's great because high school was awesome. You know how people hate high school? I did not. I loved high school. High school was awesome for me too. It was. A, it was. A, it, was a, it was a great. It was a great time. Yeah. Um, okay. You do you still live on the same property you grew up on? Well, more or less. It's a little bit more complicated than my thumbnail sketch. My dad worked for the railroad when I was growing up, and it's my mom's side of the family that has the farm. And so my dad moved us all over the country at following railroad jobs. And then um, our touchstone was always back at the farm. So holidays, weekends, summer vacation, all the you know, time always spent at the farm. It's funny you say that because yeah. that's going to give back to what, what, what I want to emphasize on, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so, in in high school, were you working or just going to school, hanging out, and chasing girls? Uh, both, both. But so, I guess back to my background. Growing up on a dairy farm, like there's never a spare minute. You're always working. You're feeding the animals. You're cleaning out the stalls. You're milking the cows twice a day, every day until you die. All that kind of stuff. So, when I got into high school, I started working. I was doing that, and then I was also working in a diesel shop. And okay. Wait. A, wait a second. Now, how, 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 how much did you milk cows? How many cows? So we had about 250 when it was at its height. And, you milk, and of that, you milk about half of them all the time. You keep half of them in a rotation. So we about 125 we milked twice a day. And I don't want to give the wrong idea. I did everything I could to get out of milking cows. Like, I would fake sickness. I would join the football team. I would go in early to school. Whatever I could do to get out of milking cows because I hated it so much. Wow. I liked all the other aspects of farm life. I liked living on the farm. I liked the hard work of it, being outdoors, all that kind of stuff. But okay, so why, why did you not like milking cows? Well, I, I don't know. It's kind of like you're just trapped for four, for four hours in the morning and four hours in the evening. You're trapped in that stall milking That's, cows eight at a time, eight that, at a time. That, eight at, and it's... 
Robert, the thing is, it's that way from now until you die. The rest so of your life. Really the hurt because it's twice a day every day. They, they don't give a shit about your hangover. They don't care that you're not feeling good or your daughter's getting married. You got to milk the cow. Get his milk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, not a fan. So, okay, so after high school, then what? Uh, after high school, um, I took a year off after high school. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. Oh, no, no, wait. I got that wrong. I took a year off after college. After high school, I went right to Penn State. I had always thought I was going to play football or, you know. You, kind of you look like a football player. Well, not next to you. You look like a football player. <laughs> so I, I got up to Penn State and I tried to walk on. Come on. I would have been the smallest free safety on that team. And I would have had to get a truck to drive as fast as those guys. So anyway, it, that didn't work out. But I did. I loved going to Penn State. I went to main campus all four years. I studied political science. I thought maybe I would get involved in like politics or something. But I loved the whole experience of it. And then during that time, I was doing a little woodworking. I was working a couple side hustles at the same time. I was working at the diesel shop I worked at through high school, running the record. I became night form by the time I graduated high, uh, college and you know I was just kind of doing my thing all right so after college then what after college I took a year off my mom and dad got divorced I moved out to Illinois for about six months built my mom a house and then I was working at the diesel shop and like being the night foreman running the wrecker and just kind of figuring okay out so I hope, so you 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 built your mama house like built a house not pay for her to have a house built no no we built it we built it so my mom and dad like a lot of things go you know they sort of waited i guess until i was in college and then they got divorced so i i came out to uh, help my mom out she moved back out with you know to her family's area and uh, my grandfather and i were sitting around at thanksgiving and we drew up plans for a pretty simple house uh on the back of a napkin or something and Hell, we got a buddy of ours to dig the, the uh, basement the next day. So Friday after Thanksgiving of whatever year that was. And then, you know, just through uh, luck and perseverance, we just built a house real quick. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Well, it's a little different here in the country than it is where you live, too. If you want to build a house, you just fucking build a house. You don't have to go talk to anybody and ask for their you, you don't have to get permission and a plan and no. <laughs> no. pay a whole bunch of fees. Is, no. is that house... Is that house still standing? Yeah, my mom still lives in that house. It's a little gamble roof house. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. All right. So then what? So that was a year after college. Then I was sort of bouncing around while I was working at the diesel shop, just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And um, I took the LSATs in the fall of that year that I took off school. And I did pretty well. Like, I'm a really good test taker. You know how some people are good at public speaking or good at this or good at that. I'm pretty good at taking tests. I don't know if I know anything, but I can figure out what they're wanting to ask and try to get right. what they want. So I did pretty good on the LSAT. So I applied to a bunch of law schools just to see kind of what would happen. And I got into um, George Washington Law School out in D.C. And nice. that was the best one I got into. And it was a top 10 law school. So I just decided, oh, fuck it out there that, that, that was a that was a good choice <laughs> okay so well, i think it was i had a good time out there and i and i i guess back to the melting cows thing again i love school school is great you go to school you see your friends you learn stuff you hang out girls i mean people talk about the pressure but whatever dude try living man um, right it, it i had a great time in law school i really enjoyed it now it was ninety thousand dollars that i'm never going to get back but it was uh, it was a good time, and I met some amazing, amazing people from all over the country there too in my in my classes. All right, so okay, so you're in D.C. in law school. What else did you did you do? In, were you just in school in D.C. or were you did you have any side hustles? Did you work just straight school? <laughs> you know, you know, guys like us. What was I gonna do? Just stand around, stand on the corner, wait for the bus? <laughs> so, what so, can I get into? Yeah, well, so I quit my diesel mechanic job, and I and I literally just packed up everything on my Harley, and I drove to D.C. the day before school started. I had hooked up with a friend of mine and got an apartment. Wait, so so you drove your Harley from 
Well, it was from Pennsylvania. I was living in Pennsylvania. Penn State. Yeah, yeah. Just very a little hike. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was, it was not too bad. It was summertime. <laughs> right. So, okay, your Harley at the time, was it an old Harley or was it a new Harley? This one was pretty new. Uh, this is maybe a not safe for work thing, but it was a real thing. So I, I want to say that thing, it was a Sportster, and it might have been about a 93, 91, 90 model, something like that. It was some anniversary model, and they decided they were going to get ladies involved in motorcycling. So they painted it pink from the factory. And you know what the color was called? Like, for real. This is People can fact check me. If you call me a liar, I don't really care. It's a great story. It was called Titty Pink. <laughs> and they're going to sell this to ladies. Like, have you ever met a lady? Do you think ladies like that kind of talk? Come on. So anyway, it sat there and sat there and sat there, and I finally bought it from the dealer. So it was the first new one I ever had. Right. That, that's a perfect way to not sell a bike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I got a hell of a deal. And then I think it's funny that you get this grizzled white dude riding around on a Harley with no helmet. Like, well, I had long hair at the time and a big beard. And it's like, what is that guy's problem? That's Listen, let, let me tell you, when I worked at the Four Seasons Hotel, um, one of my best friends that was, was Monica Bijan, and she dated this guy who was a documentary maker. Yeah. You know, he's in New York, he's making documentaries. Sure. So they would fly to these bike fests. Yeah. And, and document bikers and tattoos. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And she would call me Bobby. She goes, Bobby. She goes, we go to this motorcycle uh, meet. She goes, it's all grizzly, yeah. grungy white dudes. And they're listening to Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that's so, well, so uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's part for the course. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so anyway, DC, I, roll, I roll into D.C. Uh, I just start doing my thing. I start going to law school. I took... So, like I said, I was a pretty good student, good text taker, but I took law school really seriously that first semester. And, man, I buckled down. I didn't go out. I, like, didn't have any side jobs or whatever. And, I mean, I, I tried harder than I ever tried at school in my life. And school had always come pretty easy to me. Man, I got all Bs and Cs. And I was like, Bs and Cs? All this work, right? Yeah. So I was really discouraged. So the next semester, I started – I got a – well, I made myself <laughs> – if I want to get C's. <laughs> yeah. So the next semester, I started going out and just kind of being who I had always been. And then uh, a little bit of a backstory. My mom had a, a small lunch counter when I was growing up. She did 100 lunches every day at a little town in Alton, Illinois, in an antique shop. When she sold out, she sold out. But she's a tremendous cook and a tremendous baker. And so I had a couple of her really hardcore baking recipes for cheesecake. Uh, for um, apple praline pie and for carrot cake. And so I, I love coffee too. So I started making myself known around the coffee shops around the town. And I started delivering cheesecakes, carrot cakes, and apple praline pies before school and after school every day. And that you baked? My home kitchen. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then I'm delivering these things and I got pie baskets on the back of my Harley, on this pink Harley. And it's hot in DC. You know how it is? It's not New Orleans hot, but it's hot. And I'm riding around. It can be. I'm riding around shirtless on this thing. I mean, this is 25 years ago. And <laughs> these one guys at Franklin's Coffee House, they do Dupont Circle. They're like, "Ooh, beefcake with cheesecake." And I'm like, "That's me. That's me." <laughs> so anyway, so I was doing that, and then at the same time, I had met uh, my future wife. You know, it, she was my girlfriend at the time, and her sister was married to a guy who had a T-shirt printing business. And he had a little bit of extra space in the corner of his warehouse. And I, I made a deal with him to clean that out. And I helped him maintain his machinery. And then I got a little woodworking shop going. So about, that was probably about uh, 1994. I finally got a little space in the city where I could start making a few things. So that's what I started doing. Cool. Okay, so um, you finished law school, then what? So I finished law school and then... You know, I kind of from a very conservative, old school background, you know, get a job, go to work, you know, support your family, build your future, buy a house. So graduated law school in June, took the bar exam, got married, bought a house and started a job all within like a month. It was crazy. Um, so I got a job. 
I guess going back to the law school thing, um, I'm the oldest in my generation. My grandfather always kind of beat it into my head that you need to go to law school or figure out these laws so we don't lose the farm to taxes and things like that. So that's the kind of law that I um, sort of specialized in while I was in law school. And I got a job right out of law school. I got lucky and uh, went to work at a small firm where we just did trust and estates, will, probate, and tax planning. And I did that for about a year. And all during that year, I was building furniture, building furniture, building furniture. You know, I, at the end of that year, I had about a year-long waiting list for people who were looking for furniture and, you know, woodworking uh, from me. So I wasn't really happy in the office, you know, in that time. Um, and my wife knew it and I knew it. And we finally made the decision after that first year um, to just go ahead and go full time as a woodworker. All right. And, and also, I know if you got a year wait, you're making money. So you got this job that you're not, the yeah. other job you're making money at, you're like, wait a second, let's, it, it makes it more difficult to stay in, stay on plan A. Well, that, that's right. We were, we were starting to make money with the furniture. But I'll, I'll tell you what else. And here's, here's the secret. And here's the takeaway from the entire interview. You want to go and be a furniture maker or a woodworker or chase slabs all over the country like you and I do. You need to find a wife who will, A, put up with it, and B, earns a lot of money too. And C, she ought to be pretty smart. So, yes, with, the, you the, know, the, the first the, two might preclude the third. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my wife was always very, very supportive. Um, we were a little bit older than a lot of people when we got married. So, like, we were already adults. She already had her thing going. I had my thing going. We got together, and it just made everything better. Yeah, so, I think Ben, ben talked about that, too. That was, that was, a, that was a, a, made his life a lot easier on the move and the transition to Chicago. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah so, so, where was your shop at this time? While you went, well, I mean, while you were working? Well, when I was in D.C., uh, my first shop was in Adams Morgan, which was in an old warehouse in Adams Morgan off of 18th Street. Um, and then when we bought the house, like, big thing for me was we're going to have a two-car garage and a basement in the house, so I got to have a wood shop, which is not that easy to find in the city. You know, it's not right. New York City, but D.C., you know, it's a pretty big town and, like, a lot of row houses and stuff. We looked and looked and looked, and we finally found a house on, um, on Adams Mill Road overlooking the zoo, Kind of a transitional neighborhood, but in the back had a two-car garage, and in the basement had a full basement. So that's where my shop was when I first started professionally. So how long were you in D.C.? Uh, I was in D.C. I think about nine years. Yeah. Okay. So I started the business out there, and we were in business, I don't know, five, seven, eight years before we moved back to the farm. <laughs> We moved back wow. to the farm in 2002, and I started the business in 1995. Okay. So you, you came back to the farm with an established business. That's right. Yeah. Well, and um, all during that time, I had been coming back and forth to the farm to harvest raw materials, manage the forest, you know, do all that. I do my sawmilling, everything out here, which is kind of crazy, 14-hour drive. But, you know, maybe that's how I kind of got my teeth cut as being a road warrior a little bit. We, 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 right, we'll get to that, right. With your dad, the whole thing, life on the road. So, yeah. So you decided, because you were doing all the milling at the farm and bringing it back to D.C., yeah. better just to do it all. In well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I would have moved back to the farm maybe right after law school. But, you know, you get married and you, you got to make decisions as a couple then. And my wife had some very good businesses DC. She had a bar called the Toledo Lounge, and then we started a restaurant called 1910, and then we had a nightclub. Um, so, you know, we had some pretty good businesses in D.C. And, well, you're always hustling. Oh, yeah, man. My, well, my wife, she grew up in the bar business. Her dad owned the most famous bar in Toledo, Ohio. It was called the, uh, the Peppermint Club, and then it was called the, the, what the hell? Oh, the Country Palace. And, like, Kenny Rogers... You know the song, um, in a bar in Toledo, across from the depot, she sat down and took off her ring. You know that one? I mean, it's yes. a classic. Anyway, it was written in her dad's bar. So Sweet. Like, 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 but anyway, so that's who she was when I met her. You know, she was already, she had these businesses. She and her sister went business together. And so uh, I would have never sort of supposed that I could just, 
get her to move out to the farm because it's a completely different way of living. It's very yeah, it's another life. Here. Yeah. So we happened to be out here. We had just had our son, and we were out here for just like a two-week vacation, chilling. Well, she was chilling, and I was like, you know, sawing lumber like I do. And um, she's like, this is just awesome out here, and it's great to have mom help with our son and all this stuff. She's like, we should really consider moving out here. And so that's that was the sort of impetus of that. And that was in, what, 2001, like early spring of 2001. And we started looking around at houses. A neighbor whose, whose property uh, joins our property said, hey, man, you know, I'm going to sell this place. If you guys want it, I'm going to sell the deal. We had a bunch of people interested in our house and in our business in D.C. We just kind of turned the switch, made it all happen. And, dude, I'm telling you what's crazy. So we sold everything and bought everything, but we were in transition. None of the closings had happened. And then 9-11 happened, and we're, we're sitting on the front porch of our house in D.C. watching smoke from the Pentagon, and we're like, we're getting out of the city. That's enough city life for me, man. Wow. It was kind of crazy. It sort of made me think that we had made the right choice. At the right time. Yeah, yeah. Two yeah. weeks later, different story. Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you what, hindsight being what it was, I wish I still had that house in D.C. Because what was it? What was a seven hundred thousand dollar house is now a two million dollar. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know right. how that even works. And man, as much as you're on the road, you probably wouldn't have sold it. You'd be like, I'm going to need that two months. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not that smart, I guess. <laughs> okay. So. Um, all right, so you're on the farm, you got the shop. All right, here, this, is, this is the good part. Now, what, what, I, um, what I admire about you is I'm, I'm watching your page, I'm checking stuff out, and I see that you came into a show, you came, you came out for dinner, so I'm watching your page and I see that you're all over the country doing shows. Yeah. Now, okay, when did that start? And yeah. then we talk about some road trips. I think that's a good segue because when we, so when I was in D.C., there were no real furniture makers or, or very few, especially right in the city. So, you know, you could leave your condo and you could get on the red line and you could come to a furniture maker shop, design a piece of furniture, go back to your condo, and then it'd be delivered three weeks later. That's pretty crazy. And I had people just beating a path to my door. You know, this is like 94, 94. 96, 97, 98, 99. You know, there weren't a lot of people doing this kind of work then. It was, Ikea wasn't around yet, and it was kind of just, you know, you'd go to, uh, what, Macy's and buy your furniture or something. Right. It was just a different thing. And, and being in the restaurant business and uh, also the friends I made through law school was really good sort of word of mouth market. And we threw ourselves a couple of furniture shows, like we threw one in the Woolly Mammoth Theater, we threw other ones. Uh, here's, here's a fucking pro tip for some of you guys starting out. You get somebody, one of your clients who orders like, I don't know, five or six pieces of furniture from you, you tell them, okay, I'll deliver for free, my, myself, my guys, we'll come, we'll set, it, we'll set your house up, we'll throw a party for all your cool friends, and you can show them how cool you are by supporting this amazing craftsman, we'll buy a couple cases of wine and we'll throw some canapes on the on the table. We'll sell some more furniture. We did that a lot in DC, and it really, really very smart the business grow and got the word of mouth going and the buzz going. So that's what that's what we did. And then back to your question about doing shows, when we moved back to the farm, I wasn't there like you know, glad handing and handshaking, back slapping with everybody all the time anymore. Which, which is what you're good at. I, well, thanks. Well, business started to go down and business started to go down. Now, I was having more fun and doing more stuff in the woods and whatever, but and my shop was better and all that kind of stuff, but I had to figure out a new way to go out and find business. And so that's when we really started looking at shows and events and things like that. And this was uh, 2002, so the economy was doing pretty good then. And... Stephanie and I just sat down one night and we broke the country up in thirds. You got the East Coast, you got the, the middle part, and you got the West Coast. We picked five shows on the East Coast. We did those uh, the first year and five in the Midwest and then five in the West. And we just started hitting the road. 
<clears throat> All right. So let's slow this one down. Yeah. Okay. So five shows on the East Coast. Yeah. Would, would, would that be how many shows per year would that be? So at one time I did 18 shows a year. I did that for a couple years. So that's 18, three or four days shows where you're out of the shop, you're traveling to and from, you're dragging all your shit across the country. So I did as many as 18. For a lot of years, I would do like 12. You know. So, so that, that's <clears throat> that's at least once a month. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what's the average travel? Oh, geez. I don't know. Uh, there is no average travel. I tell you what, I can get to Brooklyn in about 12 and a half hours if I just get after it. Yeah, and half many times. Now, Brooklyn's one thing. Brooklyn's one thing. Then you got to get out to the tip of Long Island to Montauk to do that show. That's a lot further. People don't realize that. And the longest part of the trip is going through fucking Manhattan. It's crazy. <laughs> yes. yes. You know what I did one time? You, I think you'll appreciate it. I, I drove the whole way up to Connecticut, took the ferry. Took the ferry from Orient Point over to Montauk. Now, that was awesome, but that was also stupid. <laughs> Now you know. I got that delivery truck on that ferry. It was relaxing on the ferry, though. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's what I started doing. And it, I would try to group, I try to be smart about it and group the shows together. Like we do Montauk and we do Philly and we do Baltimore, you know, and DC, like do a chunk of them. We yeah, so you go from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. And then come back to the farm and just build furniture as fast as I could and ship stuff out and deliver stuff. And then also at that time, 90% of my work, I was delivering personally. So you buy something from me at the architectural So you had to go back. Yeah, but that's also great marketing. People don't like to ship. Here, here's something we don't like to do, right? Like as a group, we don't like to finish furniture because finishing sucks and uh, there's many ways to screw it up. And we don't like to ship or deliver. The three big mistakes. If you become a finisher, you got one of the major keys of furniture making handle. If you Product become control. a shipper, you don't have to worry about somebody else messing up your deal or upsetting your clients. And then if you're doing it yourself, you can reinforce all the time. Mrs. Smith, you made such a great, uh, uh, great choice when you chose this lab. It looks so amazing in your beautiful, you know, cold water flat over here in uh, Massa Peak or wherever. You, you know, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me add something. Yeah, we we did some furniture for uh, a company Zynga in San Francisco. They yeah. do the um, uh, the games gaming. Okay. So we sent the furniture out there. Yeah. And they come to us and go, "Oh, they're not in the cutouts for the electric on the sides." Yeah. That was never in the plan. Yeah. So she was, "Oh, that's no problem." Um, we have a client down the street. He'll take care of it. I said, uh, no, you won't. <laughs> I'll be there. Good for you. Be because you know what happens when he comes in and take care of it, right? He takes yeah. care of the job, too. <laughs> well, two so, things could happen, yes. He takes your client, which, hey, man, what are you going to do? And the second thing, if he messes it up, it's still your problem. Exactly. Yeah. So with, like, two or three days' notice, I got on a plane, I flew off to San Francisco, yeah. got a hotel, got it all done. Yeah. Um, came back. Yeah. And 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 Dave, we and, and I'm I'll post an so now. We we just got another job from that client. Yeah. Doing 40 screens from PayPal. There you go, man. See that you, I don't know, man. I don't want to turn this into like a business TED talk or anything, but it, just treat treat people, treat your clients the way you want to be treated and, like, go that extra mile. And I'm telling you, man, they will pay you back every time. It's, now, it's all you can, hey, you can be a hard guy. You can say, this wasn't on the contract, so how about you go take a flying leap? And they will. And they'll never see you again. Or you can say, you know what? This was an oversight. I, I'll throw myself on an airplane. I'll be out there. I'll make sure everything's cool. And then, you know, then you got an extra forty grand in your pocket a few a few years later. Yep. Right. And you know, and the, the, the thing too is um, a, a lot of this is about relationships you make. Yeah. Because there was another instance where we did a job in in uh, in Brooklyn. It was a it was a big job. It was a high profile job. One, 
I took too little money for the job because it was high profile. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, I didn't have a relationship with the client. Yeah. I had the relationship with the architect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The architect had the relationship with the client. The architect, um, there, there was a problem there. Yeah. Right? It fell on me. Not the architect. Yep. She moved out of the way. I, I, I had to catch the ball falling. Yeah. That cost me a lot of money because I didn't have a relationship. Yeah. It costs a lot of money, but also it, it's difficult psychologically, mentally, you know, all that kind of stuff. And here's one thing that I make very clear. This is maybe another takeaway. What I give my designers, my architects, I give them a substantial discount, right? But I don't want to know your client then. I don't want to deal with the client. And the client is your problem because you're earning your money for taking care of the problems, right? And if I'm taking care of the problems, I don't need you. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I have very stern conversations with designers and architects from time to time. And they're like, hey, fuck, how about you fuck yourself, Dave? You're just a fucking furniture maker. I'm like, that's right. And there's a million of them, okay? But if you want my stuff and you want to work with me and you want to have the, the sort of peace of mind. The service. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then this is the deal. And you have to control your clients. And listen, I know how difficult it is to control your clients. You have to be in constant communication. You have to manage expectations. You have to cheerlead for them a while. These people, I mean, they worked hard for the money they're spending on this kind of stuff. Again, it goes back, you just treat them the way you want to be treated. Got yeah. struck. And listen, you're right. Because what, what we're going to do, we're going to pivot back to your traveling. Okay. Because this, this is the conversation that I want you and Martin to have about the intricacies of the client. Because both, yeah. of, both of you do that very well and done it for a while. That would so, be an interesting conversation because I think we come at it from opposite directions. I really do. Yes. Anyway, but that, that's for another day. Um, okay, so, so you're on the road. Yeah, and, and and what I'm trying to do is get get a get get a picture of how much this becomes a part of your life, yeah. or your life is interrupted by oh, you man. packing, packing either one <laughs> by you packing up all of your stuff. Yeah, you drive across the country to a show. Yeah, right. And if you're doing that many shows, yeah. Money's tight because that's why you're on the road. Oh yeah, man. So did you did you did you all sleep in the van or did you get a hotel? Well, so that's a great great question. So the first few shows I did, I just put I, I had a Dodge Diesel pickup and a 13 foot covered trailer, and I just hit the road and did it all myself. I would sleep in the back of the truck, had a camper shell on it, and just do my thing, you know. And that that was okay as a what 35 year old, 32 year old single guy on the road but you know i needed to find a way to incorporate the family a little bit more because i mean i was gone all the time and when i wasn't gone i was in the shop like 18 hours a day um which is the truth like literally in the shop busting it out so what i ended up doing was i bought a second hand slide-in camper for the truck and then i built a extended hitch so i could still pull the trailer I loaded the wife and kids and all the food we could carry in the in the camper, and we'd be gone for like I don't know 40, 40, 50, 60 days at a time, and we would just live in that camper. We would we would go to campgrounds, you know, and get a space and have a hook and everything. I've done it. The only way we could do it at the time, the family now they refer to like that serious uh, that period in our life, like we were on severe austerity measures all the time. Austerity measures, kids. They're like, oh, I'm gonna go to the gas station and get a slim gym. Hey, man. Austerity measures. Austerity measures. We got, we got, you know, six day old bananas in the car. You're eating those. And then also, dad knows how to screw up every vacation. That was the other thing. <laughs> kids, guess what? We're going to Utah. They'd be like, oh, we want to see all the national parks. I'm like, yeah, we got four shows. And be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way we cobbled together shows plus family time plus vacation plus visiting clients you know it, and it wasn't though my life was interrupted at all it's this, this is our life that's what i mean it becomes a part of your life yeah and i think growing up on the dairy farm where you're literally living where you work made good sort of uh that was a good preparation for this because i 
people start talking about work-life balance and all that shit. I have no idea. They might as well be speaking Martian to me because I don't know what they're talking about, man. I, I live... That's a millennial term. It's something, man. I mean, if you want work-life balance, go work for, you know, U.S. Steel in 1956 because those days are over. Now it's work. You just work. I don't know. It, unless you're like your buddy who did documentary films. I mean, whenever somebody tells me that, I'm like, what's your dad do, you know? No, let, listen, let me tell you, yeah. she paid for that. <laughs> I believe it. I mean, you know, there is ways to do it. He didn't, he didn't have any money. She paid for that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. You ever wonder about that? I mean, you look around somebody and he's spending money on this, spending money on like, where'd you get that money? Where'd you do that? Who your daddy is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So what, what was the furthest you've traveled to, to a show? Hey, I'll tell you what, um, I want to say 2012, probably, we did a show at the tip of Long Island in, in Montauk. We did an art show out there. And 10 days later, we were at our art show in Jackson Hole. And then four or five days after that, we went to a wedding in Barstow, California. And we did it all in the, in the truck and trailer. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> How, how many hours on the road is that? I don't know. It's a lot. It's a Ten lot. Ten days, half of it got to be driving. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure, yeah. A lot of it, that, that trip was a little crazy. We never did that one again, but... I know, bet. Yeah. We... I don't know, man. I guess you were right about growing up with my dad on the road. You know, he drove his truck around all the time. To, he, what, what his company did was put trains back on the track. So if there was an accident... It didn't matter if it was two in the morning, they'd load up the trucks and they'd head to the accident, fire up the caterpillars and start winching stuff back together and putting the, the, the trains back together. And so I kind of just grew up doing that. It's like, yeah, oh, I don't feel like doing a 14 hour drive. So you got to drive right. 14 hours to sell a $10,000 table. You get in the goddamn truck. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny how, how you come up, come back to the things you grew up doing. I know, you can't get away. You might as well not even try. I know, it's it's crazy. Right. And I, you know, I'm pushing 50 now. I've been doing this for, what, 25 years. So you start to sound like your parents. You start to say the same shit they always said to make you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. I don't know. Okay, so now you would, you would go back to the same shows every year. So you would develop clientele. You would get to know people. And then they'll become regular. So it would continuously feed itself. Yeah. I'll tell you a crazy thing about the... So when I started in 2002 going to a lot of shows, um, I was still throwing myself a show at least once a year. We'd have a big party at the farm. I'd throw a show, invite all my local clients. But there were not a lot of real furniture shows. There were the fine furnishing shows on the East Coast that Carla Little, she still runs on. There was the Architectural Digest show. And then on the West Coast, there was Dwell. Everything else was like an art show. Like we'd go to, uh, you know, in the park with a bunch of tents. And so I just square peg, round hold that deal. I was like, I will show up. And it, I guess another sort of thing is 2006, 7, 8 was recession and everything was really bad. I would tell people that were running these shows that, because shows are hard to get into. That's my, my point is these art shows tough to get into for a furniture maker because you know the kind of stuff I do it looks like anybody with a chainsaw can do and they probably could but so I would call the promoter of the show and I'd say listen I will come and I will buy two with two corner upgrades and I will bring the biggest stuff you've ever seen and they loved it and let me in their shows because how many goddamn jewelry makers you want to see at the show? You know what I mean? Jewelry, 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 leather wearables. Jewelry, 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 leather wearables. <laughs> Whoa, giant slab tables. This looks visually interesting for our show. So that's another sort of thing. I, I just started doing those shows and getting in by the fact that I would be crazy enough to show up. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we still base our business a lot on that, Rob. Right? I mean, I think you guys do too. I'll just do stuff that other people won't even think about doing. You know, we're building some 25 foot ash community tables right now. And I had a couple of people ask me in Israel, why would you build them so big? That's crazy. And I'm like, because I can and because nobody else will. And there's a, and, hey, 
word to the wise, you can charge a premium for that kind of stuff. Yeah, because it's rare. It's rare. That's exactly right. The, the, the ash tree, no, the ash tree is not rare. 25, whatever it is, though. Well, and just being willing to deal with it. Yes. It's the same thing, though, like, I don't want to be down on our industry or whatever. A lot of guys, they just don't want to do what they don't want to do, and I totally get it. But don't be that guy, and then also be the guy that complains they don't have any work. Yep. So. Yeah. It's, you know, um, I think Ben and I talked about this after he got to Chicago. Dude, ben is the ultimate hug. If you ask Ben a question, the answer is yes. Like, it, and he will figure out a way to make that happen. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that's what we were talking about. He's like, um, I said, you're doing a lot more stuff now. He goes, dude. People call me. Yeah. I say yes. I get the money. Yeah. And I figure it out. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've been to his new shop up there, but his shop is part Not of yet. a complex of shops. And, you know, he can walk probably 10 blocks in a radius and find just about anything. He can find metal workers, sandpaper manufacturers, guys who polish and plate. I mean, plastic manufacturers, injection molders. That's, that's a real resource. Forget if you even use those people to do any work for you, but it keeps creatively. You're like, oh, I could do this and I could do that. Yes, Be being cool. able to walk into another guy's shop and seeing him kill something that's amazing. It yeah. motivates you. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I think. Um, uh, change the topic a little bit, but I used to get a ton of inspiration on the road too, because you know you're in different parts of the country, you see different things. Your yep. art shows. You might see somebody who's doing two-dimensional you know, wall art, but they're doing something that just catches your eye and it keeps creativity, it keeps it flowing. Yes. And I worry about sometimes getting tunnel vision in this business where I'm just making big flat surfaces all the time. But I don't know. That's kind of where my need has, has gone to. Um, you know, I just sort of downplayed people saying no to stuff. But I think another thing is as you get more established – know you've got certain jobs that you do saying no to other jobs where you know are going to be a problem is also very powerful yes yeah there, there's a such thing as a bad job yeah yeah and there's such things as clients that you're not a good fit with too and, and it's it's very hard to say i'm uh, just not not only because you want the money and you want the job but i mean guys that are in sales like we basically are or people pleasers, man. We want to make you happy through our client. But sometimes you have to know that some people are never going to be happy and don't want to be happy. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the thing. Don't, don't want to be happy. Yeah. And you yeah, know what? We, yeah, we had an instance where a guy, um, we sent the guy a contract, right? Yeah. So he sends the contract back marked in red. And it was about, you know, take half of the payment. We get half when it's there. And he goes, well, what if I don't like it? Just a, whole, a whole bunch of things. Mm. And it took us two or three weeks to get back to him on yeah. whether or not we'd do the job. Yeah. We were thinking, nah, nah, this was a while ago. And it's like, should we or shouldn't we? Yeah. And, I, and I waited so long, I needed to work. And, and I took the job. Yeah. That person was my, today, my worst client. Yeah. Just the, the, the whole thing. And you so, felt it. You felt it in your gut, but you just needed to do it. And listen, we've all done it, man. We've yeah. all done it. And maybe if you haven't done it yet, you will, and then you'll never do it again. You'll it's never do it again. Yeah, there's, 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 there's some things you need to walk away from. Yeah. And, and that's when, when, the rent's do, when the rents do, you do things sometimes you wouldn't normally do. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think someone said you should never negotiate like you're broke. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good one. That's good. Yeah, sometimes you're broke though. <laughs> probably, right. and you can't fake it. It's probably that trust fund kid, you know, <laughs> telling you that. He's never been broke in his ass life. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Okay, so, um, okay, hey, let's let, let, let's get thing. to. Hey, can I just tie on one quick thing on the show you, stuff and yep. get out there? It's kind of like um. Uh, I really enjoyed woodworking and I really wanted to make it my life. And I really enjoyed the furniture and the woods and the whole process, but I needed to figure out a way to make a living in order to keep doing it. It's like that permission thing. It's like, 
when you buy a piece of my furniture, you're not really buying a piece of my furniture. You're giving me permission to continue making furniture. Yes. So you're investing in my business. Yeah. And the whole sales, the whole idea of doing shows and getting out on the road was the best answer we could come up with for with the money we had, with the resources we had to try to sell more furniture so we could actually make a go out of this. So that, that's the bottom line of all that. It wasn't like I had some grand master plan. It was more like I, I need to figure out a way to make this work or else I'm going to have to do something different. The hustle is real. And, I, and, that's, is. and yeah. that's what situations do. They, 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 yeah. they make you figure out how to make it work. Yeah. All right, so let, let's get to some questions. Okay. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch here. Okay. Um, I see one guy here saying, it's not paid in full 50 down and balance due before it leaves my shop. I don't, sh I don't ship it. Um, I try to stick pretty hard to that same rule. Now, if you're a longtime client or somebody I know, I, I'll go ahead and ship it, but I agree. And also, um, you know, I don't think it's a secret. If you're not already in the black at that 50%, you're not charging for your product. You know what I mean? So that other 50% should be profit and maybe plus shipping. Right. Here, I see another guy asking about contracts. This is one of my sort of, uh, I don't know what to call this, one of my bailiwicks. So I am an attorney, right? I, I'm not no longer active, but I did pass the bar and I practice law for um, My contract, it says, almost verbatim, it says this. Dave Sign Furniture will build you, and then there's a nice description of what we're going to build. And a, a number of the slab and a photo of the slab. And you will pay Dave Sign Furniture 50% deposit. And 14 weeks after I receive that deposit, you will receive your furniture. And I will receive it. And that's all set. It's all set. So the, so the two pages I have is too much. <laughs> you got to do what's right for you. But... I think I don't want to give legal advice to people. You give somebody a 10 page contract, you're already boiling for a fight. Now, maybe, you know, maybe you've been beat down by life so hard that you got to do a 10 page contract. Now I've been knock on wood. I've been very fortunate. I have only ever had one client bounce a check to me and I've only had a couple clients where I had an issue and the, you know, like your, your guy in, uh, or, or your people out, out west, you just take care of the issue. You take care of it. What are you going to lawyer up on that deal? Tell them no. Um, and it just makes life easier. And also, I tell you what, man, you think I'm a hippie or something, but people are pretty, pretty nice in general. And if you say, hey, man, what do you want me to do to correct this problem and make you feel like you got what you needed? And most people will just say, uh, actually, it's okay. I just wanted to kind of be heard. That's what they're telling you. You know what I mean? I need a hug. <laughs> yeah. Or I had a client, and this is where I guess back to um, sort of uh, having your designers control their client. I had a client in California, built the table for him. I got sign-offs on the slab, sign-offs on the design. I shipped them with finish samples, sign-offs on that. They come back, the client just doesn't like the table. And I said, okay, what do you want me to and she said, well, if I pay to ship it back to you, do you think you could sell it to somebody else? And I said, yeah, that's what I did. So she shipped it back. I sold it in a show a few months later, sent her money back. Everybody was completely fine. It was a little bit more work for me. And a lot of people would say, why would you do that? She made a mistake, blah, blah, blah. I make mistakes all the time. If everybody made me pay for that, I'd be about three inches tall by now. Anyway, I don't know how I got off on that tangent, but. No, that's that's what it's about, man. You, you, you have to take care of the clients and, and your brand has to have some type of guarantee yeah. that you stand by your work. You know what I say? People say, well, what is your warranty? I say, if I'm dead, you're out of luck. If I'm alive, I will take care of it. That's what I tell them, lifetime warranty. Yeah, there you go. My lifetime. <laughs> We're just getting shorter every day, so you better buy something today. <laughs> Um, I see Jeff Whitney says he uses the principle of keep it simple, stupid. I agree. Just keep it simple. And um, having a good relationship with your client keeps it simple. Yeah. Yep. Let's see. 
Yeah. Uh, Jack English says the contract is only good for court. And I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, if, uh, if it gets to that point, and you've already lost, you've already lost. Right. Someone here says, how did you deal with the kids in school during this time? When you on the road? Well, so as it happens, a lot of these shows are during the months when the kids are off school. The summer. So, you know, yeah. So all summer long, we'd be gone. Now, the stuff that's in the wintertime, I would go by myself. Or like the Architectural Digest show in New York was always during my kids' spring break. So it just so happened that that worked out. So I would drag my, my son Oscar, who you met, I would drag him with me and force him into helping me. So, yeah. He's but, cool with it. Yeah, he's a, my kids are great. They're not interested whatsoever in my business, but they can be team players when, when pressed. Yeah. But, and as far as, uh, you know, the family stuff and school stuff, you know, we just made it work. I don't know, man. It, 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 it's a constant, everything's constantly in flux. There's a constant negotiation. You know, yeah. you're always just trying to make it work. Right. Um, here says, um, have you considered adding a time and materials clause to the contracts for those situations? I think, again, uh, one of our other followers, Jeff, said, keep it simple. Just keep it simple. And I think maybe what that client or what that um, questioner was asking might have been about like for, for change orders or overages and stuff like that. I tell my clients, um, I used to have a little clause in my contract when I was closer to being a lawyer, but I don't have, you know, change orders, you know, we just have to discuss and come up with a mutually agreeable solution. Like, cause if you change the project, it's green, you know, you're, you're out of luck. The one thing I do have in my contract is that the deposit is not fungible. And that's never been a problem um, because if I start cutting on a slab for you, you man. right. Yeah. So okay, so the 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 people in California, the lady who didn't like the table, you sent her money back. Yeah. Did you keep the deposit or you gave you return that? Well, she had paid a deposit before I ever started working. So uh, the way I keep my slabs is um, as they come out of the kiln, I put a. Uh, like a, uh, what am I trying to say? I put an index number on them. So like walnut log 100, uh, you know, slab seven, whatever. And then I keep a database. And um, so I'll send you photos of slabs to choose from. And then you send me a deposit. And then nothing happens until that deposit check clears. Then the slab comes to the shop and we start work. So with the lady in California, her, um, her, she picked her slab, she did the whole thing. Um, what I returned to her was basically full price because I told her full price, so I returned to her all the money she had spent, but I didn't return the shipping. She shipped it both ways. Right. Okay. Um, Jeff is pretty active here. He goes, at least you're not milking cows. He's correct about that. Milking cows is the worst. I don't care what you do. Milking cows is worth it. <laughs> Um, so Peter has a furniture ask what shows, Oh, what shows lately? Have, have you they, done lately? There's nothing happening right now. And I can tell you from my experience, and we look at this pretty hard from a numbers point every year, uh, especially my wife has come on to the business full time. She's been with the business about 10 years and she's pretty good with the numbers show costs continue to go up travel uh booth fees etc show returns continue to go down um so we have really cut back in the last five to six years on shows um i was talking to rob earlier the first time in 15 years this year we were not going to do the architectural digest show in new york city um you know, the last couple of years, we've just seen the return on that deal go down and down. And so now we do a lot more marketing and we spend that time and that effort, Instagram, Facebook, and doing more local stuff. Um, it's funny, where I live in the Midwest, we kind of have a, uh, a little bit of a chip on our shoulder or an anti-homer buy. Well, Dave Stein built furniture, but I don't know. He's from here. And, uh, like, we feel like we're not quite good enough. 
something. Meanwhile, I go to New York and LA, people can't wait to buy the first. You the man. So it's taken a long time for the Midwest to sort of catch up and think that it's okay to buy my furniture. So now we've been doing a lot more local stuff, which is awesome because, yes. you know, as, as willing as I am to jump in the truck, if you don't have to, it's great. Exactly. That's a necessity. Yeah. And not a luxury. We've whittled it down to, so to answer the question more pointedly, we were doing Architectural Digest show. We were doing a couple shows in the, in the West uh, in resort towns like Telluride, Park City, uh, Jackson Hole, a few others. And then we would do uh, our end of the year show up in Chicago at the one of a kind show. But uh, we got into some of our West Coast shows this year, but I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't even know if they're going to happen this year. So we're kind of in a holding pattern right now. Okay. All right. All right. Now we're, we're going in on an hour. Okay. So we could um, continue after the hour or we could ask more questions, wrap it up at an hour. Uh, your call. Um, I'm good for probably another 20 minutes. And then as, as you would love it, we're delivering furniture up in Pike County today. <laughs> we got a mask. We got. Hey, here's a crazy thing, man. So we got a mask up, put our goggles on, and we're gonna head up there, deliver furniture, wipe everything down, and then get out without even talking to anybody. Yeah, exactly. Get in and get out. Yeah, and two nights ago, or Thursday night, last Thursday, uh, Eli and I we delivered a 14 foot conference table. It was two parter, thank goodness, to a 10th floor high rise in downtown St. Louis. But we did it after hours, after everybody was gone. Security let us in. You know, wiped everything down and got out. It's things have changed a lot. Yeah, and, and, you, and you have to be able to pivot and make moves based on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had somebody ask a question about you know 14 weeks. Almost always it's 14 weeks, and it doesn't always take 14 weeks. But I always tell people 14 weeks. You need that time because if you get it in 12 weeks or 10 weeks, I am the best guy you've ever even heard of. If you get it in 16 weeks, I'm a jerk. So. 14 weeks is the number, and it's not that jobs take less time than other jobs, but there's a pipeline. So you, I got to put you in the pipeline. So that's the deal. Yeah. Got to get in the queue. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Steel and grain. Hey, how about steel and grain? Man, that guy's a, he's a worker. Yeah. He's coming on. Yeah. He, uh, he's like, delivery day means payday. <laughs> Oh, somebody's asking about restaurant business. Um, you know, it's funny, man. I've got probably four restaurants full of tables sitting here that were waiting to be delivered when this stuff went down about seven weeks. And we're in a little bit of a quandary as to what's going to happen. Now, clients are all good clients. They're like, hey, man, we're going to make sure you get taken care of whatever. But in the meantime, I'm sitting on a month's worth of work and got paid for because it's restaurant stuff. So right. we're going to have to work closely with our restaurant partners to figure out what's going to happen during this consistency. I think it may be an opportunity to, you know, do more two tops, do more stuff that's based apart, maybe less communal tables. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'll work with my clients and do whatever I can, but it's, Things are changing in that world, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so look, we, we, we're we going to hop off yeah. and hop back on because we have a minute and nine okay. seconds remaining. So let's hop off and we'll go for another 10 to 15. So I'll just hit stop and then you'll come back to me? No, we, we have to get completely out Okay. and then come completely back on because um, Instagram cuts you off at an hour. Very good. All right, man. All right. See you in two seconds. Yep. Or three. All right. Wait on David to come back in. There it is. All right. Hey, buddy. Yes, sir. So um, we were talking about, um, I guess, the, the new thing, and, and, and Ben uh, pointed this out, is the social distancing. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, I don't know how that's going to change for my clients and my restaurant people. Um, I know Eli and I are practicing it in the shop, even staying six feet apart and, you know, doing our Yeah, work. that's what we're doing now. Yeah. When we stay six feet apart. We, all, we always have on a mask. Yeah. Um, the mask is all day long. We don't, we don't, I got no, we don't, we don't communicate without it. Yeah. I'll tell you what, too, having the mask on is actually a good idea. We, we have dust collection, but our shop's still dusty. I've been feeling better since I've been wearing that mask all day long. Well, as you know, most of the time I haven't had a, a, a dust collection, and we've always had a mask on. Oh, so my God. That, now, we, that, we, just, we, we, can't, we can't change them every day. I give them, like, I two a week. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we were lucky. We had the, we've got some dust masks that I bought years ago from, um, I think they're called Evo, and they have replaceable filters. And I'm kind of anal about stuff like that. So I had five, six replaceable filters and they're P100 masks, you know. So we just wear those all the time. But you look like Bane from Batman. <laughs> um, so we have a question here. Sure. It's, it's to you. Do you work with specific designers and restaurant bills or direct with the biz owner? Both. Both. I'm My basic... Whoever calls. Yeah, my basic business philosophy, you got money, you're my best friend. So... Um, I love working with designers and professionals in the field because they can help really get the conversation started and we can work in multiples, uh, and then build a relationship for down the road. When you're working with an individual client that you meet, you know, just personally, sometimes, you know, you put a lot more effort into that for less return, but I'll, I'll work with individual restaurant clients all the time. Uh, with the caveat that I am not a restaurant designer, you know, but I'm, I'm happy to, to, to help and give my opinion and, and also connect people too, that, which is a, a whole nother part of this relationship building is, you know, once you've been doing it a while, you start to know somebody who upholsters booths and somebody who does wiring and another guy who does sound and all that kind of stuff, which is good resources to have. Um, uh, fashion set, what's the highest profit in a single piece slap? As much as you can get. <laughs> yeah, the highest profit is 100%, but I haven't hit that yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Um, um, oh, no, I think they're asking, uh, Fashion Set is asking, like, what segment of the business? Like, selling slabs or selling, like, maybe uh, regular edge stuff or selling chairs or whatever. Um, in that case, it depends on how you build your business, right? We yeah. have gravitated over the last 10 years to big, and I tell people this all the time. I build, what do you do for a living, Dave? I build big flat surfaces. That's what I do. If you want little tiny, you know, uh, dressers and jewelry boxes and horse shit like that, I am not your guy. If you want a big flat surface, a headboard, a coffee table, a dining table, you know, restaurant tables for miles, I'm your guy. But yeah, so... I think your profit and your profitability and also for me, like my mental health comes from doing the things that I actually want to do and yes. make that your primary goal. So, yeah. Uh, and, and so fashion said, our primary goal is to make big platforms because we do well at, it, and we're set up to do it. Question to both of you guys. Oh, pricing. Yeah, pricing is a tough one. Um, when you're yeah. when you're doing something that can be compared to other work, you kind of have to go with the market, market rate. pricing. Now, if you're doing one-off custom slab work, like giant tables, yeah, it's it's there is a market for that now. But I tell you, 20 years ago when I started doing these giant tables, man, oh, I, I, you know what? This is maybe an interesting story. So, I guess maybe. 23, 24 years ago, we sold our first giant slab table. Pin oak slab table, 42 inches wide, 10 feet long. I had like 12 slabs, beautiful pin oak that I had cut, harvested, dried, the whole thing. I took it to shows for about six months at 2,500 bucks and nobody even looked at it, right? People were, did, did, didn't care. So I was kind of getting frustrated. I had talked to a friend of mine that sold more luxury goods. He said, man, you're, you're pricing that so everybody can have one. You time materials that bullshit. Not everybody can have that. And you need to make sure they know they can't have it by the pricing. 
So I was like, okay, great. So the next day I went back to the show, I put $10,000 price tag on, I sold it in five minutes. Not even kidding. And I never looked back because you can't be fighting yourself on pricing. You're not the client, the client's the client. And that yep. wants to know that this is a one of a kind thing that not everybody can have. Yep. You, so. you, you went from obtainable to unobtainable. When it became unobtainable, people wanted to obtain it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, steel and grain is saying only a small handful of people have access to 16 foot long single slab walnut. Well, that's why they have to come to me, buddy. I mean, <laughs> duh. You can have as much as you want. You just have to come to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Let's see what else. Uh, we got somebody asking a question about equipment. Wood miser for dimensional, Lucas Mill for large slabs. That's exactly what I do now. Um, and then recently, uh, a friend of mine nearby got a, a wood miser 1000. And I might just get out of sawmilling because that thing is awesome. Okay. All right, I, I, I wanted to talk to you about that. Do you do your own milling? Yeah, we still do most of our own milling. We've got the Woodmiser LT40 that's been here for years. And we just keep, keep it keeps running. It's a good machine. It's always been good. We've got the non-hydraulic version. So, you know, it's a lot of work to run. So, but uh, how do you cut those big, those big slabs? Well, I use the Lucas mill. Okay, you have a look. When we started out, uh, Robert, I actually built an Alaskan mill myself uh, out of, uh, you know, Unistrut that they use in buildings, like the yes. hang stuff from. I built it out of Unistrut, and I had two steel 075s uh, on the end of a bar that I welded the ends together. And I just sharpened my own chain and started cutting slabs. Um, no. that, I did that for probably four years, and then we finally got uh, a Lucas mill. And I haven't used that that two man much since then how big is the lucas mill uh it'll do 60 i want to say if you really you know hold your mouth just right it'll do like 64 inches between the guys okay now you you okay i just saw it. you just upgraded your shop right oh yeah yeah that was a big deal for us we when i moved back to the farm the, I bought 40 acres in a farmhouse that had a barn on it right next to where I grew up. And I converted that barn into a shop. And we, it was 3,600 square feet. And I was in there from 2002 until 2019. And then last year, there's a big shop about a mile from my house that came up for sale. So I bought it. And now we moved into it. And I, I spent a year rewiring, remodeling, cleaning out all the junk and sort of make sure the roof didn't leak and all that stuff while we still worked in the old shop. And so you, you, purchased, you purchased the building? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll it's be. building on a couple acres, you know, it's just, it, but it's, it's a commercial building, you know, so it, it was perfect for this. It actually was a cabinet shop when it was built in 1997. Okay, how big is that shop? Uh, it's about 13,000 square feet, so it's nice. Yeah. It's yeah. massive. Big upgrade, big upgrade. And uh, we installed two more of our Nile L200 kilns here. And then there's still the one at the old shop. So we can have three kiln loads running of about two or 3,000 board feet at a time. Wow. We can have three of those running at a time. And then uh, all our production that comes off of the LT40 and the wood miser goes through there. And um, yeah. yeah, so it's been, it's been really good for us. I, I bought it for years because uh, I didn't want to spend the money and we built a tremendous amount of furniture out of that old shop. But things are so much better now. We, we're, we're not tripping over each other. I mean, you're a machinery guy like I am. I was moving machines in and out for a day at a time and hooking them and unhooking them so I could do jobs. And then they'd go back out in the, uh, in the unheated shed so that we'd have room to work. And now it's not like that. So we're pretty lucky. Um, is there a standard thickness you cut all of your slabs to? Does uh, length matter? Length and species matter. Um, the real big stuff I cut at three inches. Uh, the real small stuff I'll cut at, you know, two and an eighth or something. When you're running the Lucas mill and you're kind of seat of your pantsing it, you can do what you feel is the right thing to do after, you know, having some experience. Um, but one thing I would say is having, uh, having a common standard thickness makes your life easier when you're stacking 
Yeah, I, I, we cut at two and a quarter. Two and a quarter all unless, of unless everything? It, yeah, everything. Wow. Uh, um, unless it's big. Yeah. You know, the, the really big, long stuff, I try to get two and three quarters. Yeah, the really big, long stuff, I cut it a solid three. And I some people say that's wasteful, but they can fuck themselves. Yeah, no, it's, it's you know, Dave, let me tell you, I, I thought about doing three. Yeah. This stuff moves. It does, and especially... Well, like we were working on a piece that we're getting ready to deliver today. It has a big crotch in it, and it's like 55 inches across at that crotch, and then it's 14 feet long. And uh, I was really, really glad I cut it at three because then I got an inch and seven eighths of final thickness. And I flatten on both sides. A lot of guys don't bother with the bottom side, but I flatten on both sides. I finish the same way on both sides. I'm not looking for any trouble. Yeah. So. That's the way I do it. But yeah, it, it goes with experience. But the bigger stuff I do slab at three. I, I almost never do anything over three. Although I do keep a big supply of cants, I call them, just squared off logs. Some as big as like 24 by 24 and 24 feet long. I keep, there's probably a couple hundred pieces around that size and smaller that I use for different things. Uh, you know, somebody calls any beam replacement barn or they can't find it whatever and all that stuff seasoned and ready to go um but other than that i don't cut anything thicker than that and stuff that's like charcuterie board size or bench size i'll cut that at two inches and still get an inch and a half out of it yep yeah I, yeah that stuff i cut i cut um smaller yeah yeah let's see what else we got here you know that's oh that's a question you don't hear that often although safety you hear all the time shop safety is important is being organized i think the best thing to do for shop safety is don't work tired that's the best thing you can do when you're when you're too tired you make mistakes yeah fatigue it gets you listen professional woodworker right amateur woodworker right there now i know that's not funny especially if you ain't got no fucking fingers but working working safe i think is mostly about not being tired, being on top of your game, not being distracted when you're running these big tools that will absolutely fuck you up. Yeah, they're dangerous. Yeah. And, 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 it's, and, and honestly, a lot of it's common sense. Yeah. Well, I, you know what, man? It is and it isn't. I grew up on a farm around machinery. I, you know, we did dangerous stuff all the time. And it's not bragging or anything. It's just the way we grew up around machinery and animals and you know dangerous stuff so i do a test all the time when i get a new guy starting like does that guy know where to stand so he doesn't get killed you know <laughs> and there's a lot yeah, to that. yeah and it doesn't it, right and it doesn't take long to figure out if a guy knows how how to behave in the, in the on a work site in the yeah shop. yeah and you're right it is common sense and it's keeping your head on a swivel but it's not for everybody you know not common everybody sense is not so common and it's nothing against people. It's just not for everybody, you know? I get two tests that I do to people when they start working for me. I get them to sweep the shop because if you get one of those guys that just leans on the broom and does one of these numbers, he's not going to work. I like a guy who works up a sweat when he's sweeping the shop. You know what I mean? And yeah, then the other and, thing and, is, does he know where to stand? Here, so there, 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 there's guys who sweep, and when they sweep, you got to go behind them and sweep because they don't know how to sweep. And that is not okay. Yeah, which is another shot, another, another and then, there's, then there's guys that are teachable, and there's guys that don't want to learn. <laughs> I, I, I run into the latter. The yeah, former. I see. Um, don't don't want to learn. <laughs> Chairmaker says a healthy respect is needed for most machines. He's absolutely correct, because that machine doesn't care whether you're alive or dead. Yep. Now, that's David. David, do it. No. Um, uh, David, David. Dave, tomorrow... David and I are going to talk about, he makes chairs. Yeah. And he and I are going to go in my yard and we're going to talk about how to choose the correct part of the log in a chair. Yeah. So yeah. That, 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 that'll be tomorrow. Um, cool. That'll be cool. Hey, I see somebody's asking, what's the best advice you can get somebody just started into building live edge furniture? Um, this will sound tongue in cheek, but it, I think it's really true find something else to do it is now that i'm almost 50 years old i can tell you it has been a very very difficult way to make a living
And it I is. spent more time at the shop than I have with my family. And I don't regret it. You know, we've had a good living and we've, we've, we've stayed together and everything's been good. But it is, if you're going to do this successfully, there may be somebody who has better secrets than I do. But I think it's an extremely difficult way to make a living. And it's becoming more difficult because there's so many more people. It's getting crowded. Yeah. And, and, and I, think the, the, I think the good craftsmen always rise to the top and the people who build the relationships, like you said. Um, I don't know how many used uh, Alaskan mills I've bought through the years that have only been used one time. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, some guy, I just, some guy I just, retires. Some guy retires from the whatever, and he buys him an Alaskan mill. And he's gonna, he's gonna tear up the world, and he finds <laughs> out that this is a lot of hard. Work. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. You so if, you you, buy mold, I, if you want to buy moldy lumber and a used, and a used Alaskan mill, just watch your local thrifty nickel, folks. <laughs> it's coming. I started out one of those chainsaw mills once. Yeah. I went back. I went back to work. I worked hard. I saved my money. Went and bought a, a, a bandsaw mill. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so much work. It is. It is the chainsaw mill. I did it that way at first because I, literally, I just didn't know how else to get that product. Right. I didn't have the money to go out and buy something monstrous. I thought about building a band mill. I thought about a lot of stuff. But we used that chainsaw mill for probably four years. And uh, I owe a lot of my business to my cousin, Josh, who was unmarried at the time. And he would come by every day after work and we'd saw for about three and a half hours. And then my wife would make us an unbelievable dinner. And that guy helped me start this business. I mean, the, the amount of time we spent on either end of that chainsaw mill. I mean, I, I blew up half a dozen of 75s and 76s through the years. Okay. I, it was great. Where's Josh now? Josh, Josh is a surveyor. Yeah, he's a surveyor. Uh, he's a partner in his business. He's a great guy. He's a great. Oh, here, this, I think this is a funny story. You'll think this is funny. So, you know, on a good day, I'm about 260. On a good day, you're about what? 260? 240. Are you really? 250. 250. Okay. All right. That's a well, bad day. Let's just say we're both 250, right? That's a bad day. That's not a good day. <laughs> So we'll grab, I'll grab the end of a piece of lumber and just sling it, you know, just grab it and sling it. And then my cousin Josh would grab the end of a piece of piece of lumber and then his feet just move across the ground. He's like, I don't understand. I go work out all the time and everything else and I, I can't move that. And you're like overweight and everything else. And I'm like, well, I, I weigh 250, you weigh 120. It's just physics, man. It's physics. It's very simple. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, Let's see what else we got out here. Uh, Norman Leatherworks just tuned in. What's up, Norman? This guy's amazing, Leatherwork. Hmm. I love I love leatherwork, and I think that's a cool craft too. Um, <laughs> Steel and grain. I've seen his shop well on Instagram, but he's like, "Who sweeps their shop? That's weird." <laughs> right. Need someone to come in and do that. No time for it. Jeff Whitney says he's 178 years old and he's been doing this for 50 years. I think he must mean 78. <laughs> he's got an epic. He's no, got an epic at his beard. Picture, he might be 178. <laughs> <laughs> he's got an epic beard in that photo, though. He does. Yeah. It's a cool cat. He's from New Orleans too. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Um, so Steel and Grain says, "What's retirement look like for Dave Stein? Any plans?" I I don't really have any plans for that um i've been really fortunate my health is good uh 50 years old been doing it for 25 years i just plan on continuing to work um i've had eli with me now for seven years he's really really good and he pretty much runs the shop now so i can do stuff like this you know so it's only two it's only two of you it is right now we had another guy who um he went to work at the steel mill right before all this corona stuff happened and then um we've got the guy that I call my Sawyer, who's been a family friend for my entire life, he's struggling right now with uh, with pancreatic cancer. So we're really worried about him. But um, we're, normally we're we're four of us uh, plus my wife. But right now we're just running on a little bit of a skeleton crew. All right. 
um, Sasha said, rare species of wood? Oh, for me, it's just stuff that grows here. So none of it is super rare um, in terms of like, you know, exotics and things like that. I just don't mess with them. I, it's all stuff. Yeah, um, Sasha said, we, we, don't, we don't do imports. Everything we do yeah. is, is native. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to say um, um, American chestnut. Well, that is, um, yeah. That I, is. Got, I got, I have a couple of logs that are like 52 inches by nine feet. That's super rare because um, they're marked. If you can find them, they're, they're, they become like government property because of the rarity of them. You, um, you actually were able to find some logs and saw them? I, I got the logs. I hadn't saw them yet because they're 52 inches. Wow. Well, just send them out here. <laughs> I, I have a buddy who said that. He goes, listen, bring those logs off over to me. I'll take care of them. Yeah, yeah. He, he didn't believe me. He he's a he's a second generation Sawyer. He saw it for Nakashima. Yeah, wow. When I told him when I was on site, I sent him pictures. Yeah. He goes, "Where are you and when are you being in your yard?" As soon as they got, he he's never come to my shop. He's, I've been knowing him for ten years. Yeah. He's never come to my shop, my yard. Yeah, yeah. I told him I had chestnut. He was there. He met he he was in the yard before I got to yeah. check it to make sure that I wasn't lying. Well, it's it's very unusual. I mean, apparently there's a few um, sort of sentinel type examples that still exist after the the big blight that went through. I think we're going to be in the same boat with with ash here pretty soon. Yep. Um, you know, somebody asked uh, Jeff. Oh, Jeff again. What 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 do you think about the slab market in the future? I'll tell you what. Um, people have pre been predicting the death of slab furniture now for 10 years or more. And it's still kicking. Yeah, I don't want to jinx myself in any way, but I'm, I'm starting to think that it's going to be just another tool in the of designers and, and builders and tastemakers, you know, just like um, not, just like French furniture, modern, mid-century modern. You know, I think it's going to just become a style touch point that can be used, you know, in the future as well as it is today. I mean, it, it, it's not quite as hot as it was five, six years ago, but it's still, people are still pretty interested. Let's see. Do I work in river logs? No, I do not. Uh, yeah, you can tell Jeff is from New Orleans We're talking about sinker site. site. Right. Yeah. Oh, here's the one. So everybody's always hitting me up about finishes. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Listen, and you know, and, 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 um, and Tyler was talking about that too. And, I, and, I, and, and um, Caleb Wood is the same thing. Some stuff you own. Yeah. Well, and it's yours. I've made, I, I think it's a great community and I love the generosity of people and I try to be generous too. If somebody calls me, I mean, I don't know how many times I've talked to people about shows or about uh, milling or whatever, but I kind of got burned a little bit a few years ago about finishes. I did a, um, I was doing a test of several different finishes and they did not do what the manufacturers claimed they did. And I told everybody that, and man, I got lawsuit threats and Twitter, Twitter troll bot coming out of the woodwork and i'm just like you know what i don't need that so my advice on finishes is just try a bunch of them and use the one that works best for you and your client yep i mean there's plenty out there yeah let's see ha huh. blood sweat and tears that's what's in his finish i believe it um what's the power bill like running your kilns it costs about a hundred bucks a month to run a kiln out here. Yeah, dehumidifier, right? What's that? Dehumidifier, right? Yeah, it's just they're Nile L two hundreds. I think it might be one of the most popular kilns around for small operators. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it costs about a hundred bucks a month to run each one of those. Yeah. Oh yeah, Jeff Whitney's talking about uh, the. Um, fascination for the current design so much uh epoxy yeah it's not really my bag but whatever people want to do i don't care 
Yeah, so as you said, do you cut down your own live trees? Uh, mostly what we cut is stuff that is dead or has been wind damaged. We're here in the Midwest, we get a lot of tornadoes and stuff. And I keep a pretty good eye on the forest that's under our control in my family. And I just take stuff that's dead, dying, or stuff that's encroaching over where my cousin is still farming. And uh, that way all the best rootstock is still out in the, in the woods making new trees all the time. So we've been fortunate in the way that our land has been managed you know, for four generations before mine because it's never been uh, that somebody's come in and just like clear cut everything and taken all the good stuff. So all the big stuff is still kind of just waiting to die and then I go get it. Now, if I see something where the top is blown out of a walnut tree, I don't wait to see if it's going to come back because, you know, you're just grading at that point. So I'll take a big tree if it's been damaged. But other than that, I leave the big stuff out there. Let's see. I don't know what that – Jeff is very active today. He wants me to lease him flaps. <laughs> um, I got a, my battery. Oh, you're running low. I was on one of these the other day, and my phone got too hot. <laughs> um, good now. I don't know. I think we've probably covered a lot of ground. It's getting to be nine thirty. I'm going to have to hit the road. Perfect. Hey, I really appreciate you taking the time to have me on here this morning. I enjoy Thanks, this conversation, man. and uh, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm alone out here in the wilderness or something. So it's always nice to touch base with somebody, especially like you. You're always interested, and I think that that sort of uh, I don't know inquisitiveness that you have is one of the reasons why you're so successful because you really care about other people and the process. And I mean, if yeah. you, well, you guys follow Rob on Instagram. Yeah, this guy's into. Beatles and he's into uh, brass fans and I mean you just name it. This guy, he's yeah. well. The the thing that I'm into that I hadn't got into yet yeah. is old Hobart mixing machines. I'll get into that later. I got one to show you. <laughs> is it close? It's in my. It's in my. Uh, well, I'll send you a picture of it later because it's in a garage at home. Uh, I, quick, quick story. When I was ten years old. My mom really wanted a KitchenAid mixer, couldn't afford one, whatever. So I was, even then, I was scrubbing through the thrifty nickel all the time. I found this one. It was the first model that Hobart, I think, made for KitchenAid, branded KitchenAid. And it's, it's a tabletop model, but it looks just like a floor Hobart. And it came with every accessory under the sun. It's got the meat grinder. It's got the flour grinder. It's got the ice cream freezer. And I mean, this thing is from the 20s. I think I think it's a um, it's a N or G, and it's right around 1914. You think it's, it is? It's not it's, a Hobart. It's the, the, it, no, Hobart turned into KitchenAid. KitchenAid. Okay, okay. Well, I'll show you the picture of this thing, and yeah, I, I, I use I, it. I still use it all the time. And yeah, I, I have. I have yeah, I have the original um, mixer as well. That's cool. <laughs> they, came, they came with a cabinet and everything inside the cabinet. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. That, yeah. That's a whole other thing with a whole bunch of it's bananas. I bought this thing for 25 bucks and I was 10 years old. So that would have been 1981. And I mean, my mom, I don't know how many thousands of pies and cakes she baked with that thing. And then I took it to school with me and did the same thing. Yeah. And this you thing know, weighs it, about what a safe weighs. It's crazy. Yeah. And the, the thing is, the on the old mixes, everything on the inside is metal. On the yeah. new mixes, everything on the inside is plastic. Yeah. So when you get to like maybe a couple of pounds, the the new mixers get hot. Yeah. And burn out. The old ones blow right through it. Yeah, they don't care. This one, this one, it, when I got it, it had a screw in fuse in the back. You know what I mean? Where the power that's comes a, in. It that's had, the early oh, one. had its own uh, safety. <laughs> All right, awesome. man. Well, hey, thanks very much. I'll send you a picture of that when I get in the garage next time. Thank you. I would say tonight, six o'clock, we have Chef Kluger, who's um, you 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 should uh, check him out. He's a good guy. He has a restaurant, uh, Lauren Place, uh, Lower, oh, yeah. Lower West Side. I saw that was coming up. I read up on him. Seems like a real good guy. Yeah, uh, been in a restaurant business all his life and um, got a restaurant. Wednesday is um, uh, three by three customs tomorrow, uh, 10, 6 p.m. It's Black Box Print Studio. Friday is Geo Veneer. So that's the lineup. All right, brother. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.
Steve Hoffman. Thank you. All right. Stay safe, everybody. Bye.